Good morning to you from here in Lagos, Nigeria. It's shortly after 10 a.m. West African time from our studios. My name is Tolulokwe Adelaru Balogun. You're welcome to this special broadcast from New Central celebrating Namibia at 32. And I'm Benga Aborowa. Good morning to you all. Um, welcome to a special Independence Day broadcast, Namibia at 32. We have quite a lot in, stock, in store for you today. We'll be looking at governance, we'll be looking at security, and we'll also be looking at the youth and the future of Namibia. And we're not doing this alone. We have a team of expert uh, resource persons that will be joining us uh, from Namibia to discuss all of this and more. And the issues, of course, are issues from independence to date with freedom, of course, that uh, happened during the Namibian War of Independence, sometimes also called South African or the Angolan Bush War. But 32 years later, what progress has the country of Namibia made? What's the future of the country as well? And as Benga said, we're going to look at issues surrounding governance, the security, youth, the economy as well, the issues that constantly make it on the front pages of any country and particularly become much more important on a day such as this in celebration of independence. Uh, very, very important. But before we start, we have a package prepared by our team uh, to talk about the history and the country of Namibia. Enjoy. The name of the country is derived from the Namib Desert, the oldest desert in the world. The name Namib itself is of Nama origin and means vast place. That word for the country was chosen by Mbruma Kerina, who originally proposed the name the Republic of Namib. Before its independence in 1990, the area was known first as German South West Africa, then as South West Africa, reflecting the colonial occupation by the Germans and the South Africans. Officially, the Republic of Namibia is a country in Southern Africa. Its west border is the Atlantic Ocean. It shares land borders with Zambia and Angola to the north, Botswana to the east and South Africa to the south and the east. Although it does not border Zimbabwe, less than 200 meters of the Botswana right bank of the Zambezi River separates the two countries. The people of South Africa join me in wishing you and the people of the new nation of Namibia prosperity and good fortune. Namibia gained independence from South Africa on the 21st of March 1990 following the Namibian War of Independence. Its capital and largest city is Windhoek. Namibia is a member of the United Nations, UN, the Southern African Development Community, SADC, the African Union, AU, and the Commonwealth of Nations. In the later part of the 20th century, uprisings and demands for political representation by natives of African political activists seeking independence resulted in the UN assuming direct responsibility over the territory in 1966, but South Africa maintained de facto rule. So what was the acceptance of the role of the five and participation in these talks are based essentially in 1973, the UN recognized the South West African People's Organization, SWAPO, as the original representative of the Namibian people. The party is dominated by the Ovambo, who are a large plurality in the territory. Following continued guerrilla warfare, South Africa installed an interim administration in Namibia in 1985. Namibia obtained full independence from South Africa in 1990. However, Wavis Bay and Penguin Islands remained under South African control until 1994. Namibia has a population of about 2.55 million people and is a stable multi-party parliamentary democracy. Agriculture, tourism and mining industries, including mining of gem diamonds, uranium, gold, silver and bass metal, form the basis of its economy while the manufacturing sector is comparatively small. The large arid Namib desert from which the country derived its name has resulted in Namibia being overall one of the least densely populated countries in the world. You welcome back. Happy Independence Day to all the 3 million plus Namibians celebrating in Namibia and across the world. Uh, quite an interesting um, 
<laughs> package, I understand, don't worry. Yes. Yeah, and it, when you realize that Namibia gained independence just 32 years ago, mm -hmm. um, it, you, it's not to say it's one of the youngest countries, it's one of the youngest independent African nations. Very true. Um, and then that also follows in suit with having one of the youngest populations as well on the continent yeah. as well. Um, but when you, as I was listening, when you hear the population figure just around, let's say, under 3 million, and you look at the land and you look at everything possible, we want to expect more from exactly. Namibia in this 32 years. Exactly. And uh, there, there was a time they did uh, over 6% continuous uh, GDP, GDP growth. And uh, that stalled because of financial crisis and uh, COVID and all of that. So the hope is that they will be able to pick um, that. But like we said earlier, we're not alone in yeah. discussing this. We have uh, Joyce uh, Musen Gua. She's a human rights activist and youth advocate. Joyce in, uh, from Namibia. Uh, good morning to you, Joyce, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning to everybody, and uh, thanks for having me. Yes. All right, Joyce, thank you so much, and we wish you a happy Independence Day. Let's start with getting some of those pleasantries out of the way. So just quickly tell us, after you're done with us, how are you celebrating today? Well, um, since it's going to be a uh, holiday, uh, since it's a holiday, I'm not really going to do much. I'm not really going to do much. I am just, um, I'll be at home with my family. We will be having a barbecue. And, and that's it, yes. That's it. We don't right. really have a culture of celebrating independence in Namibia anymore because as a youth, um, I cannot really necessarily relate to the, uh, the, to the colonial times because I was not born yet. But the fruits that were supposed to be provided by this independence, I am not enjoying them. Mm. I am not really benefiting much from them. So I really don't know how to celebrate this day. As a Namibian youth, I really don't. So you don't have uh, much to celebrate. But what is a typical Independence Day celebration like uh, in Namibia? What activities uh, does the government have lined up for today? Well, the government has um, usually they host a large ceremony and the way it's usually at a stadium and different government officials are invited and then there are speeches for the entire day some cultural performances uh to sort of embrace our cultural differences and of course um there's a lot of um speeches and then people eat some food after that and then it's done that's typically how it is done in Namibia. And of course, um, it is celebrated in different towns. Um, um, like last year, uh, the year before that, I think it was in Sumep, and this year they are celebrating it in um, Mund, one of Namibia's most beautiful coastal towns. So that is really the tradition in Namibia. Yeah. Okay. So let's also bring in our second guest here, Rosa Namesis. She's a politician and a human rights activist, um, and she's also joining us, but she's joining us on the field. So she's working even with uh, the celebrations and the independence uh, celebrations going on. So Rosa, welcome to this special broadcast commemorating Namibia at 32. All right. I'm not sure. Okay. So there. Hello, Rosa. Oh, hello. Just how are you? I'm good. How are you? We're very good. So I'm going to ask if you can just quickly adjust your camera just a little bit so we can see your face a bit more. Um, but let me start the questions off with you, Joyce. Just as we asked you about what the celebrations would look like for you, you said that you're not really in the mood for celebration. And I think independence anniversaries bring about reflection um, for the citizens of any country, whether they're at home or abroad. And it's been 32 years since Namibia gained independence. In those 32 years, having a multi-party, stable democracy, some would say, has that guaranteed the kind of development that you would wish for Namibia? Joyce? Well, um, let me start off with, look, um, upon attaining our independence, we have a few victories, of course. We 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 have like you say like you mentioned we have a a, a functioning um, stable uh, democracy we uh, we attain constitutional democracy we have a um, constitutionalism we have the emerging solidarity amongst the people we um, attained uh, a good milestones such as uh, an increase in primary education and others and of course we 
We are a very peaceful, uh, very stable democracy. We have a populace that understands uh, democracy and that, that resorts to resolving issues in a peaceful and democratic manner. We have peaceful protests and, and, and demonstrations and all these things. So uh, we are, we, I think we are one of Africa's uh, functioning democracies, really, peaceful functioning democracies. But then amongst that, we have... Unfortunately, the negatives uh, uh, um, surpass the positives in our country because we have a de facto um, we have a de facto democracy. Really, if one has to put it in such, we have seen um, after independence, for instance, we have to, today we are sitting with a high unemployment rate, uh, particularly in the youth, and we have seen an expansion of the middle class after independence. But even after that, we, the, the middle class has stagnated. Okay. Even though we have seen an economic growth, we have seen an economic growth in the country, but we have not seen economic development. The institutions did not, the, the institutions that were put in place to support the people so that we increase our middle class and, um, remove our people from absolute poverty. We have not seen economic development okay. as per yet. Okay, the Joyce, economic we'll, we'll economy get back to you uh, shortly, Joyce. Uh, we'd like to bring in uh, Rosa here. Hi, good morning, Rosa, and happy Independence Day to you. Good morning, good morning. Yeah. Uh, Rosa, um, we can see you? you're on the field. Uh, can you tell us uh, why you're outside and uh, how are you celebrating your Independence Day? Okay, yeah, I, I just want to also correct this whole issue of, of the lady saying that um, we are resolving issues. I don't think that's really something that is happening much. The, the demonstrations sometimes are being uh, stopped by the police, so let us have it there. But for independence, happy independence, Namibia, from the dump side of Mariental. I am here celebrating a bit differently. Uh, I have visited uh, the, the, the people who are eating from the dump. One number of the 1.6 million Namibians who is eating from the dump, and the baby is six months old. The other baby is two months. So from two months to about 45 years old, young Namibians are here. Why I want to celebrate it is 32 years for me to live in this abject poverty is too much for me. And therefore, I decided that today I'm going to come and cook here at the dam. We want to see whether we can start a garden. You can see there is a water point there far. There is a water point there. So maybe after discussing with the people here today, maybe we can meanwhile start a garden here so that whilst they are scavenging according to uh, their life, they can maybe plant and eat from that. I am in food security, and therefore I thought I cannot go to Swakopmund. Instead, I will come to the people here. And that's where I'm celebrating um, our independence. It is 32 years. I don't think it is negative. It's just that we are not prioritizing our people and, and the change. We have to prioritize and make sure that our people are given the social services according to the votes they are providing. They cannot become just a voter. They need to improve their life. So that's why I'm here today to celebrate with these people. So um, if you have a question, I am able to answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosa. So I want to take you up on one thing that Joyce mentioned, and she mentioned that she believes that Namibia is in fact a de facto democracy. Um, even as much as Namibia is lauded for having a multi-party democracy and there are elections and there's stability and there's peace, um, a lot of people are believing that that democracy in and of itself is not bringing the development or the advancement that Namibians want. And just be able to say we're a multi-party democracy when only one party, and that's um, SWAPO, wow. has actually been in power. Is that really democratic to you? Do you agree with Joyce that Namibia is operating a de facto democracy? 
I don't actually know what it means for Joyce, but maybe it means something. For me, I think it is not quite well. Um, uh, when maybe things needed to change because it's very important that um, new, in, new blood, new stream, new ideas should come into this democracy. And if that is democracy the way it is, then we need to change it to real democracy where all of us participate and uh, I think the, the power relationship is changed. Also, I think it is very important that when we talk of democracy, that very much inclusivity and thinking and exchange sharing should, but, uh, should be part of it. I know that a civil society organization, we are consulted and after consultation, we really don't know what has happened with what we have said. Because if people could have listened to what we say, we would not be in this situation. We have been talking about this lifestyle of our people. We have talked about maybe um, changing, but I think Namibia changes in buildings, maybe in the road infrastructure, but I think there is a lot of, she was talking of the middle class. I think there is a rising tendency to focus on the middle class upper rather than down and the pyramid becomes thinner on top and gets broader at the bottom. And I think that is something that the democracy should address. And I think multi-party, they are there, but they don't speak strong and they are not strong in numbers. The number is also what counts. And then it's also this old party uh, movement, political party movement syndrome that we are having. I think we should change this and really talk and bring the democracy in. Okay. I may be talking from a different point of view. I may be also speaking very easily because I feel it differently from what Joyce can feel. I'm not really um, up there in the Eklund. I'm in the periphery. And that's maybe why I speak easily. And maybe she see, the, the people think we are uh, only negative, but it's not about being only negative. I love the country. I want the country to move and be truthful as we are reflected. We cannot 1.6 million people hungry and we keep on saying we are democracy. What is that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rosa. We'll get back to you shortly. Uh, now, Joyce, it's uh, quite heartbreaking to see uh, Rosa uh, at that Dom site, a country uh, like Namibia with its huge resources uh, and uh, it, its potential should and not have, uh, uh, shouldn't have a million plus people uh, living in those conditions. Uh, what do you think is responsible uh, for this? Um, the policies, <clears throat> our policies are not people-based. That's the problem. Um, um, our policies really um, are made based on personalities. And uh, even when you look at how the, the, the economy functions uh, in, in Italy, and of course, you, you would see that um, even before, uh, especially in the first term or, or in the terms of the first and the second president, was that appropriation uh, of bills or appropriation of funds to the different sectors in governance were, were not done according to uh, the revenue or, or what the government has made. So we, the policies, our, our policies are really flawed. How our policies are made is a very, very flawed process and we need a revamp in our policies that are people-centric. You need to analyze what is it that the people need and then that is how you implement your policies. But in Namibia, our policies are based on personalities. And that is why today we have uh, uh, different NDPs that uh, had the vision of the 2030 vision that when Namibia will be an industrialized country, we will be a fully uh, fledged um, economy that will be functioning at the fourth industrial revolution level, but we are still dealing with the issues that were mentioned in the first uh, national development plan, basic issues such as sanitation, uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, unemployment and all these things. And by this time, the vision was segmented in five year plans, which is of course the national uh, development plans. But even now we are still battling with the issues within the first um, 
within the first uh, national development plan. And uh, like Rosa Nancy's mentioned, um, the issues that are really more implemented is things that are not, the world is not invested in the people, but rather in things such as um, infrastructure and, and, and other things that are not necessarily going to uplift the people uh, out of abject poverty. Rosa mentioned that we have 1.6 million uh, below the line of absolute poverty. And these are issues as a country of a small population that are already supposed to be resolved by now. And why I mentioned the issue of the middle class or the issue of the sectors is that the institutions that are in place from a policy point of view, the institutions that are in place um, ought to support the businesses so that we expand our private sector. And so that those, 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 those businesses then uh, come up with projects or it, they draw investors and this they create jobs, which will then of course expand the tax base when more people have jobs we then we expand our tax base and then the government will have a, a much larger expenditure but that is not the case in namibia you see how the the when you look at um the procurement when you look at the state's procurement um the bigger projects are acquired by the chinese and the chinese come with their workers like we know the issue in all african states is that the chinese will come they will come with their workers they will come with their equipment and the people in namibia will benefit minimally and then the next beneficiaries from the street from the state procurement then will be the white businesses and so we don't see an expansion in the middle class of the country and more and more people are then subjected or they sink below the poverty line. And those are really the fundamental issues as a country that we are still battling with. And really one will of course then they blame corruption also because like Namibia, we are just a small country, but corruption is just as rife as in any, kind of, any other African country because the institutions that are set there that ought to expand our middle class or that ought to benefit the country entirely suffer from infiltration and corruption by the state officials. We see that um, there were institutions that were set up such as the DB and the Development, uh, Development Bank. We have the Agri Bank. We have all this, the, the SME Bank. These this, this, this institutions were set with good intentions and had they been carried out, had they carried out their intended functions, they could have really, really, um, we could have seen economic growth in the country and economic development for that matter in the country. But of course, corruption came in and these institutions had to be closed down. They were liquidated as a result of corruption and maladministration, etc. So there are a lot of fundamental issues and one would of course blame it on the current administration. The ruling regime has messed up really bad and a small country such as this, you need to have a very a small cabinet that will work effectively we have a cabinet of about 26 ministers and deputy ministers in just 1.6 million, in just two, for just 2.6 million people. And these ministers are accorded jobs or accord jobs um, as a result of brotherhood or brotherhood from, uh, as comrades from uh, that independent fought struggle. for independent liberation, liberation. fighters. And mm -hmm. they are not necessarily effective and we don't really see much change whatsoever. So these are part of the fundamental issues that we're better with as a country. Yes. All right. So I want to pick up on what you said. Rosa, um, we are seeing pictures from your um, activities now. I want to say a very big thank you uh, for what you're doing as well. Um, you know, it's a different thing to spend this kind of day on the streets with other people trying to make sure that they, in one way or the other, are able to participate. So I'm not sure if Rosa can hear me. I actually think somebody else is with her phone. Uh, Rosa, are you with us? All right, so I think we'll get her in just a moment. But I wanted to take up this conversation on the issue of poverty. Joyce, you've mentioned that. Rosa has mentioned that as well. And a recent report from the World Bank, which looked at inequality in Southern Africa, which is an assessment of the Southern African Customs Unit, uh, Union, showed that, one, as we all know now, South Africa is the most unequal society in the world, but it also has Namibia as one of the 15 most unequal countries in the world. And I really want to take a look at what does that mean? 
um, Joyce, when you hear that, what does that translate to for you? Especially as a young Namibian, um, there are issues around the quality of education. While a large percentage of Namibians are quite literate, there's also the issue of quality of education and unemployment. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that Namibia is one of the most unequal societies in the world, what does that actually mean to you? Well, structural exclusion um, in Namibia is a very, it's of, it's of grave concern, when, especially when you're speaking of the youth, when you are uh, speaking of uh, a class-based exclusion in Namibia is of grave concern. And like I said, when, when, for instance, when we speak of state procurement, the beneficiaries from state procurement, procurement which is part of the major major projects in the country. We have the Chinese um, that benefit from there, then we have white businesses, and then we have the economic elite. So the black upper class, which is mainly comprised of government officials, which are your ministers and your the, the president, your former presidents and, and their uh, 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 friends within their proximity, they basically keep on uh, um, benefiting from state resources at a much at a extravagant level at exorbitant levels that one wouldn't imagine really. For instance, I'm sure that we have heard of the fish rod scandal yeah. Yeah. that was in Namibia. When you look at the beneficiaries of, of that scandal and how much money was looted, we are talking about billions, but this is just a group of six people. So when you take the, the mastermind of that scandal who benefited about 700 to 800 million in Namibian dollars, and when you look at the person on the ground, the Guinea coefficient is definitely going to expand and it's going to keep on widening if we still have these issues. We have a, a wide Guinea coefficient as a result of the elite constantly uh, the economic elite and the politically connected constantly benefiting and or saving as proxies uh, or saving having the chinese and the white folks serve as proxies for them which then constantly and again benefits them and them only excluding the the youth excluding the 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 lower class of the country and the middle class, of course, they only the middle class of the country then only benefit via jobs, really, you know, average wage paying jobs. And it does not expand. And it does not expand, which which then leaves us with fundamental issues. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joyce. Um, Rosa, are you there? Can you hear us? I believe Rosa is still very engaged. Uh, okay, with, there she uh, is. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Rosa, nice to have you back. Hello, and you're talking to me. Okay. Yes, uh, Rosa, please, can you update us on the activities uh, where you are? And uh, what's the general mood of the people uh, there at the site? Uh, what are they telling you? Oh, the people are telling me that they are having challenges even when they are waiting for the food here. What actually happens is from the main food chain stores, the, the trucks are coming, but they are coming with more wasted because there are other people, either the truck drivers or the employer, employers there who are already taking out the best. And even when they're here, they don't find the best. What they also say is the security uh, are beating them up. Um, outside. I just was very lucky, listeners, I met the CEO of, of the town and he was just telling me that I must visit his office. That's what he was saying. But I met him, he was just dumping something here now. So, so he Rosa, didn't know this, that we are here. But he was all smiles, all friendly and he didn't say much. So okay, and then what the people are also saying is some are living on the side. I just want to show you one house quickly here where he lives this is where he lives that's where he lives this is his room that's his fridge so that's where he lives this is his house that's his dog rosa rosa i hope you're safe <laughs> she's oh, yeah. enjoying herself that's that's how the dogs are, and it's uh, just beautiful how we are experiencing this is uh, on the side. Yeah, so 
uh, we didn't know that there are dogs as well, but yeah, there are dogs as well. So, so the Rosa, owner... these food trucks that are bringing food to the people at the dump site, is it in celebration of the Independence Day or does this happen regularly? I didn't. I didn't hear you. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that some food trucks are there to give the people food. Is this a one-off because of the Independence Day celebrations, or is it something that happens regularly? The, the, these trucks are uh, the trucks from the main chain stores, like the Spa, the Vurman and Brock, and other main shops. So they come three times per week to throw out the waste and and. Today, they have not come also. That's, they are waiting for them, but they have not come. Because sometimes the, the people are saying they are coming without uh, the regular food that they used to get because it's already taken. So, yeah, no, today they are not here. We are going to rather cook for the people today. Uh, they are saying they are trying to wait. So it's also a wait and see situation. All right, Rosa, I want to follow up on young people in Namibia because the numbers have it that there are just around 700,000 uh, young Namibians, depending on who you ask. And that's, of course, uh, given the revised definition or the revised age uh, bracket from Namibia Statistics Agency. But besides that, Joyce talked about structural exclusion. Now, looking at the people on the dump sites with you, how many of them are young Namibians? How many of them have some level of education, have held a job before, or maybe have not held a job before? But in terms of the young people and bringing them into society to be able to contribute and to advance themselves, what do you think about this issue around structural exclusion of the young people as well as those at the lower end of society? Most of the people here are youth. I don't seem to find an elderly person there is about 10 elders, but the rest of them are youth and children. And when, I, when we were interacting and I was asking whether they have finished school, and so some are grade 10 dropouts. There is a challenge in our country after independence that the grade 10 uh, phenomenon has happened here. Many people have left school and they have no vocation at all. And also from the young people here, um, they are just also not skilled. They say they have a little bit of skills, but not much. For example, they can work in gardens, they can do gardening, they can do plumbing, but not much, much, much. That's what they are saying. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rosa. Please stay safe. We'll get back uh, to you soon and uh, avoid uh, those dogs. ferocious dogs. Uh, now, back to you, Joyce. Um, a prominent slogan... Uh, during the anti-colonial struggle was uh, SWAPO is the nation, and the nation is SWAPO. We've been looking at electoral trends uh, since 1990. Uh, SWAPO has uh, seriously uh, lost its uh, majority. They're not as popular as they used to be, similar to the ANC in uh, South Africa. What might be responsible for this? And uh, the beauty of a democracy is you always have options. How vibrant is the opposition in Namibia, and what are they doing to try to respond to all those uh, uh, ills and uh, make things better for ordinary Namibians? Well, you see, before independence, um, or just at the dawn of independence, of course, Swapo was the people, but also we, of course, we had other um, uh, uh, political parties that existed before independence, such as the DTA, uh, the Democratic Tunale Alliance. We had the New Do, the National, uh, the National United Democratic Organization, and uh, we also we had Swanu Southwest African National Union. These are political parties that were formed uh, before independence that also fought for independence. But of course, um, just as you mentioned in your introduction, of course the SOPO had. Um, more people from is because it's uh, electorate base is mainly from the Bambo people, which are relative, the relative majority in the country. So then, of course, by after nineteen uh, by nineteen seventy six, 
Um, I think uh, two major group, which is from the Nama uh, communities and uh, 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 Vambandaru people, who also part of the Vahero peoples joined. So for which sort of then gave it a representative picture or because now it had representative from all ethnic groups from Namibia. So then they were also accorded um, the title of, this, of being the sole representatives of Southwest Africa in the, in the UN. And so that then, of course, then, you know, emanated those slogans of Swapo is the people and the people are Swapo because they had everybody from all ethnic groups in the country. And that was very, uh, that was imperative back then. But after, at the dawn of independence, then we saw something that is very undesirable, something tragic happened where the ethnic groups, uh, where people started retracting back to mm. their ethnic groups. And we started seeing an unequal distribution of resources in the country, where most, where of course, then Swapo will channel most of the resources northward, where its electric, uh, electric base is, leaving the rest of the country, particularly south of the red line, in abject poverty and despair. And even when one looks at fiscal consolidation, we see that part of the one of the local authorities of the biggest towns in the north, which is Ochakati, uh, gets about is appropriated about 50 million annually. But when you look at south of the red line of Namibia, you have the Karas region, which is one of the biggest regions in the country. But of course, it is not as populated, which gets only 27 million. So that is the entire region which gets 27 million. And then you have a city in northern Namibia um, within the electoral base of Swapo, which gets um, about 50 million uh, Namibian dollars. So the unequal distribution then um, emanated uh, tribal polarization, which of course then now today, when you look at the country really, it is segmented even when you look at the political parties, they are segmented ethnically. And even the other ethnic groups that are not of Oshuambo speaking, that are part of uh, Swapo today, are no longer, uh, have also left this, this movement. Of course, we have other historical injustices that occurred in Namibia. We are aware of a genocide that was perpetrated by Imperial Germany, the Third Reich of Germany, uh, which, um, as a consequence, so a depletion, I mean, an extermination order was issued on two uh, ethnic groups in Namibia, with the Ovahero people and the Namo people. Their lands were taken, their livestock or economic means was taken. And after independence, once a country attains its independence, the descendants of these two ethnic groups, the other people were fighting for political freedom and maybe economic freedom, but the descendants of these two ethnic groups that endured this genocide were fighting for the land. They wanted the restitution of their land. But after independence, the genocide conversation really was put to a halt and Swapo made a, had an agreement with East Germany that in exchange of the highest, um, of the highest development aid that they will accord amongst all African countries, Swabo will put a standstill to the genocide question. So then the resettlement program that was embedded or that was, yes, that was embedded in the, um, in the Ministry of Lands and Agriculture uh, did not necessarily benefit these people that endured this genocide because they have to they have to then be restituted to their land. These historical injustices have to be corrected because the, the responsibility their office of the state. But these type of things, the unequal distribution of resources in the country, the historical injustices not being corrected by the current uh, government and all these things sort of then stirred polarization in the country. And corruption also emanated on, 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 on a trajectory that is just unimaginable and that is so undesirable that has cost um, that has caused us great economic harm. And when one of course then talks about Swapo being the people and being and, and the people being Swapo, one in fact, I mean some of us are offended by that. I am Namibian 
first and foremost, I am from the Vahero and I'm a descent, and that's it. Uh, Sapo has nothing to do with me because I am today, some of us are at least privileged to be holding jobs somewhere, but we know of people that are having youth, that are having three to four qualifications. There's a consequence of not finding a job anywhere, so they just have to continue in school. Others cannot go to school because of financial difficulties, because the institutions that ought to fund school in Namibia, I mean, a small population such as ours, school is supposed to be free up to tertiary levels. Governments such as Botswana have, uh, have gotten that right. But in Namibia, the fees are so exorbitant, we see a huge number, like Rosa mentioned, of youth that cannot go to tertiary, that cannot attend tertiary uh, uh, education. And those that can, again, sit at home because there are no jobs anywhere. The institutions and the government, the ruling regime has failed the people. So oh, Swapo so has failed dismally, and no Namibian wants to identify with Swapo anymore. Now, so when it Joyce, comes to the jo opposition... Joyce, yes, I want you yes. to get to the opposition, because with everything you've mm -hmm. said, someone would then ask, are there no opposing voices? Are there no alternatives? For a country that uh, prides itself on being a multi-party democracy, where have we seen the opposition come in? So I think that's really the point we need you to get to next. That is where I'm coming to now. The opposition in Namibia, unfortunately, Namibia, <laughs> Namibia has 2.6 million people, but we have 16 political parties, 16. And these opposition parties, most of them are ethnic based. So you, we have about, I think we have about eight ethnic groups in Namibia, and each of those ethnic groups uh, have a political party of their own. And so when you speak of the uh, of Wambo communities that have uh, that are about 46 percent in the country, and then you have all the other political parties that are being formed from an eth from ethnic lines, how then will this uh, with these opposition parties topple the ruling regime? Of course, we have part of the national um, political parties or opposition political parties, such as the Landless People's Movement and the Popular Democratic Movement. Uh, these are, I think these are the only two national um, land, uh, opposition parties and that have also put up a very strong fight against the ruling regime. For instance, movements like the Landless People's Movement has always provided alternative policies to the, the, to the government. But then the problem with the ruling regime is that they will always shun and shut down, even on a um, uh, even on legislation level, the alternatives or the policies suggested by the opposition are always shut down, and they are never necessarily taken and implemented by the ruling regime. So, for instance, when uh, um, we had the motion on national reconciliation. The opposition provided, many opposition parties provided very, very good alternatives for the current regime to implement, but they were all shunned. And in fact, what the Swapo government does is that they come up in denial and the issues that are identified, they just deny and the country is fine. And then they have this very good, you know, that in Namibia, we are part of the best constitutions. And that goes on to all our policies. Theoretically, they look very good, but they are never implemented. So the opposition parties have put up a fight. They have uh, demonstrated before. They, they, at times, you will see a very good uh, uh, unity or a unified approach amongst the opposition parties when it comes to issues uh, in the country. But the ruling regime blocks them so much that we have opposition parties that are governing two regions. The Landless People's Movement is governing two regions. And the major project, and our, our constitution has given so much power to the ministers that when projects need to be implemented within those respective constituencies, the minister has to approve. Now, this, these constituencies were attained by an opposition party and, and they were lost by the ruling regime. So for the, in order for the ruling regime to get back these constituencies, what they do is that they block any investment that was brought by these opposition parties or any projects that ought to be implemented there in the name of procedures and sometimes for no reason really. So the opposition are working very hard. They are providing alternative policies. For instance, um, 
the Landless People's Movement and the Popular Democratic Movement once provided, uh, uh, I mean, the, the LPM is based on, the LPM is based on, um, on, on agrarian reform, uh, land reform and agrarian reform. And, and uh, part of the policy that they suggested to the government was that inject more money into the agriculture so that it stimulates the economy. Into more money in our tourism sector so that they st stimulate the economy. But our government then rather inv invest in other sectors that do not necessarily stimulate the economy. And at the end of the day, that really just cause, um, it is just havoc really here. Okay. So the, the, the opposition parties are trying as much as they can, but the ruling regime really has put a stop on it and they, have, they are determined to rule until forever. Okay. Yes. I, I hope we can yeah. get Rosa back in on the conversation. Rosa, if you can hear me, please, let's get you back into the conversation because um, uh, we'll be wrapping up this segment of it where we're looking at politics and governance. Um, so, Joyce, I've heard what you said. We've heard everything you said in terms of um, the opposition trying, but then there is some form of, su of suppression happening. But my question would then be, are the people even open to new mm -hmm. choices? what responsibility or what role are the people taking in giving the necessary feedback or, or even telling Swapo that things are not happening the way they want to. So I want to quote this now. Um, Afrobarometer, which is an independent pan-African survey network, uh, did a survey in August of 2019. And of course, we know 2020 and 2021, COVID will not. So this is the latest. And what they said is that there's indications of growing frustration among Namibians. 80.6% of those who responded uh, said the country was going in the wrong direction. 72.6% described the economic conditions as bad. 58.2% believed the economic conditions were worse than a year before, while 47.3% expected things to get even worse. And then trust in the country's president decreased from 81% in 2014 to 60% in 2019. So if there is opposition on the ground that's providing alternatives, that is protesting, that's making their presence felt, are the people themselves open Response. to alternatives? Are they responsive to changing things? You have a multi-party democracy. You have the ability to change things. So why do you think the people are not moving in that direction? Well, those statistics, are, I would say that they are close to or they are quite accurate. Because we have seen, particularly from the years of 2016 to now, we have seen a major, major, major shift of people from the ruling regime to opposition parties. And that is why parties like the Landless People's Movement was able to gain victories of two regions. This has never happened before. Swapo has lost the metros in the country the municipal one towns or cities in the country, Swapo has lost it. Basically, Swapo has now been reduced to a rural, uh, um, a rural party uh, as uh, compared to when it was before. And of course, with the, the stats provided there that the president has lost uh, the popularity from age one to 56%, that in itself speaks of the shift of the support from the ruling regime to the opposition parties. The people are woke and especially the youth, because they are deprived of so many economic opportunities from all, from all spheres, you know, from the jobs. And even I, for instance, am a victim of that. I remember um, I, I have my first qualification I did was in library and information science. And I came to one of the uh, state institutions at Namco where I was looking for a job. And the lady that was working there was about 64 years old. She was supposed to have retired at 60, but she was still working there. And I couldn't get that job because she was there. She was qualified. She could not really, she was not also proficient in English, but she was working there. So I am also a victim of, of that. So we, the, 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 the nation at this point in time is woke. Um, the more people have access to information on a daily basis. So people see the newspaper articles on corruption, on maladministration and all, all, all these things. And that is how Swapo lost the metros of the country and it lost two regions to a opposition party. Um, we of course see that these are the IPs, the independent, independent patriots of change 
um, a new political four party that was formed just now, and how it also came and sort of captured many towns and many cities that formerly uh, belonged to Swapo. So there is a shift. There is a shift and people are responding by leaving the current ruling party to join the different opposition parties. We have uh, the popular democratic movement that has now 16 seats in parliament and that has never been done before. And uh, political parties like, um, uh, or political uh, or president candidates like uh, Dr. Itula, who lost to the presidency with just, uh, I think it's 40, 48% to, of course, 51 in the presidency. So we have, um, the people are responding pretty well, and okay. they, they, there has been a major shift from, from the ruling party to the opposition parties. Okay. Now, Joyce, but just before we begin to wrap things up on this segment, it's instructive that on a day uh, like this, that Namibia is celebrating independence, we talk about uh, the compensation uh, for the Herero people. Just a few years ago, the German government agreed to pay a certain amount of money, billions of euros, and uh, it led to a lot of squabbles uh, in Namibia. As someone of Herero descent, how important and how symbolic is this gesture of pain reparations? And uh, how much and how should they go uh, about atoning for the sins of the past, for their colonial past in Namibia? You see, the, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as, a, as a descendant of the victims of a genocide, as per international law, reparations are owed to me. So in other words, Germany having committed this crime according to international law, is obligated to pay reparations to me. Now, there are various laws, uh, international statutes that, uh, that, that, that buttress this cause. Reparations, um, or the, the cause of reparations to me, as a, as a descendant of those victim communities, it's very important because we are the very first African nation to claim reparations from our former uh, colonizers. So this will set precedence for nations that were colonized or nations where genocide, genocides were perpetrated. Mm -hmm. This will set precedence and um, we want the West to account for its sins, for the colonial crimes and things that went to extent of, 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 of genocide. We know that these laws are retrogressive, so they apply to all the crimes. We also have uh, laws that were enacted before uh, uh, this genocide happened, such as the Native Ex Law of 1884 and 1885, the Marson's Clause and others. So it's very important that these historical injustices are corrected. Today, um, when I look at my ancestral land, I mean, my father once took me there and I got to see the graves of my ancestors. And remember, this crime only happened a century ago. So I am the fourth generation from that, from, from when that crime was committed. It's not something that happened uh, uh, centuries and centuries ago. It's just a century ago. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we still have people that were there during that time that that for instance my grandma that was born in 1909 um just right in the aftermath i got the privilege to hear these stories from her how they were sold from how her mother uh my great grandmother was sold from concentration came to concentration came and when you look at my half of my family today is light skinned and this is not because of consensual sex, but this was because of the rape that will happen in those concentration camps and all these things. So it's um, when I look at the history, how some of us are deprived from our ancestral lands that belong to us. When I, as a uh, child of the Obahero people, is born into abject poverty, and when I graduate, I become uh, the first in the family, so I have to now pay things such as black tax to um, or give back to my family, raise my cousin's kids with my kids and my younger siblings and my older siblings and support them because of the job, the unemployment crisis in the country. I look over the street and I see a German counterpart or a, a, a child of German descent that is born into wealth that is born with assets on their names already that will never ever know the taste and the snare of poverty. So when one looks at these things, then it's, 
it's, it's very important that I get that land back because that is my mm -hmm. birthright because I am born of the very people that owned that land. The economic resources, when you look at the agricultural sector today, it is monopolized by the Germans and the white South and the white uh, Africano people. Whereas before colonialism or before this genocide happened, the clan where I come from, for instance, when you go into the history books, we owned about 15,000 heads of cattle. But today at my house, we only have, and we are a pastoral people, today we only have about 30, 40, and we were able to reimagine ourselves to resuscitate our economy as a people. But it is hard. We are pushed into communal lands with only customary rights. Even the government today deprives us from economy, from participating at economic levels because the land that we own today is communal. So it is reduced to only customary right. We cannot benefit uh, um, monetarily from that land. Unlike the white child or the white man that owns 10 farms of which uh, their daughter of my age own at least three. They take loans from, from, from a, that land, uh, uses as collateral and uh, gain assets and things. While I cannot even afford a house because of the current economic status. So these things affect me as a consequence of transgenerational trauma, economically and in every manner possible. So these reparations for me today are very, very important. They are of utmost importance to me. And, and, and as a child of the Obahero people, it is my sole duty to contribute to the fight for reparations to make sure that these reparations are accorded to our people because they are owed to us. Mm. I think, Joyce, that's a, a powerful note to end this conversation with you on. Um, and I can see a bit of that emotion coming in when you were talking about it. And I think across the continent, there are many people mm -hmm. who would connect with what you just said now in terms of what Africans across the continent are owed by the West and by those who colonized our countries, our our tribes and, and our ethnic people and transnational, uh, transnational uh, transgenerational trauma, trauma that we're still yes. dealing with. Yes, very mm. much. So Joyce uh, Muzangua, we have to say a very big thank you to you for your time today and also for sharing your words and your thoughts with us um, through history, looking at how Namibia gained independence and of course the issues around politics and governance now and particularly that very big issue of the reparations. Joyce, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you thank for you, having Joyce. me. I would also like to say a big thank you to Rosa and Namisa, a politician and human rights activist who joined us uh, live from the dump site in, in Namibia, highlighting some of the challenges and the uh, poverty uh, in the country. And if Rosa can hear us, it'd be great to have her final thoughts because we did see her just a bit and then she mm -hmm. went out again uh, because we'll be wrapping up with this segment where we looked at politics and governance as we kicked off commemoration of Namibia at 32, 32 years of independence um, that Namibia got. I think Rosa heard me. Rosa, there you are. Um, we want to wrap up things, but we'd like to hear your final thoughts on this. We've talked about Namibia being a de facto democracy, inclusivity, structural exclusion as well. And even though there is a democracy, that democracy not translating to development. So when you look to the future, Joyce talked about uh, people finally moving towards the opposition, being dissatisfied with how the country is being run. What do you think is going to happen in the next two, three, four, five years uh, as it surrounds politics and governance in Namibia? I actually uh, agree with Joyce what she says, but I just want to quickly add on the fight of genocide. I think it's very important that all of us, the Naman, the Nukwen, and the Hero people are included because all of us have suffered that fate. Um, and it's genocide from the uh, German side, South Africa, and our current government. So what will happen is I think there should be a change in the power relations. Um, I think the opposition parties should really work very hard to come together and form a strong coalition government. I think it's very important to stop this thing of being individual political parties against the Swapo government. It's really time that they come up as a one voice. The other is really that our people have to be helped to become aware and, and be 
present in terms of the service provision that they are receiving, whether it is a new government or still the Swapo government, they must really start to become critical about how they are governed and what's happening with them. Also, I think it is very important that as civil society and as, as citizens of the country, we need to really become involved and engaged. So today is independence uh, celebration. I am saying to all Namibians, this must be the last the three years we should have a new strong female president and she will help us to change the situation. So I'm hoping that I can participate in that race so that we can address this inequality and stop it forever. All right, Rosa, fantastic words to end with. Thank you so much for your time uh, for your time today, ladies. Joyce Muzangua, human rights activist and youth advocate, as well as uh, Rosa Namissis, politician and human rights activist as well. And Rosa, if you throw your hats in the ring, we are here ready to take you on on all the issues that will come up with your presidential campaign. So make sure that you get in touch with us for that. Mm, we're breaking the bias. We will definitely break it. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies, uh, for joining us on that segment.